Good morning, everybody. From Psalm 86. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Keep praying for your unsaved loved ones. Keep praying for your children who have run from God. Keep praying for your relatives and your friends. Your prayers are not in vain. God honors the prayers of his people. He leaves the 99 sheep to go find the lost lamb. He loves us all. So don't give up. <clears throat> there are people and things that we have been praying about for a long time. And prayer, in that regard, with longevity and the need for persistence and the need for just keeping at it, it can be frustrating. It can, it can be difficult to persist in prayer for people who seem to be in a helpless and hopeless situation. And we, as American people, who are used to getting what we want when we want, well-off American people get what we want when we want, when we need it, without having to think twice about it in many cases, that can be difficult for us to persist and pray because we like throwing it up there and expecting to get our answer right away. That's the truth of who we are and who we can be as, as believers as enculturated people that way. There's also a toll that prayer can take when it must be persistent. It can take the toll of doubt in our hearts. It can take the, the toll of doubt in our souls when we, we wonder, maybe he doesn't want this to happen. Maybe, maybe I'm not worthy. Maybe he's not listening to me because there's something wrong with me in my heart. Well, we know that he's faithful and just to forgive our sins when we confess, when we come into that light where we are what we are. He's faithful. And, you know, David told us in Psalm 66, if I cherished sin in my heart, God would not hear me. And that is a true statement. But we have Christ, and so there is no reason for us to avoid going to God with who we are and what we are and the reality of our personalities and our behaviors and our thoughts and our deeds and say, this is where I'm at today, and you know I'm struggling still, but I come to you for the purification. And I can pray in that, in that way. But the doubts still remain they come, especially when we persist. We may think that God doesn't love that person that we pray for or pray about, or that situation that we, we feel is way outside of his will and we wish it was different. It's a desire or a burden on our hearts. And these doubts, especially when it comes to the struggle of self-doubt, can cause anxiety and frustration and, and stress and even fear. You know, 
when Peter struggled with doubt in his life because he saw and realized exactly who he was in front of everyone, Jesus prayed for one thing for him. He prayed for his faith, that it would not fail. That is so important, and it is a reality that, you know, we're going to go through this situation of having these things happen within our souls, but this is part of the process that we go through. Having faith in who God is and what He can do is what it's all about. And it's not in my notes here, but I wrote down a, a word. It's, you know, it says, when we, when we go to God in faith with a word or a prayer and a request, man, he is, that, that's, that's exciting to Him. That we come to Him and we ask Him for something according to who He is and what He does and what He can do. And a couple of weeks ago, I referred to, to a prayer of Daniel in chapter 6 of Daniel. And I've spent some time in the book of Daniel since then. And uh, we began a, uh, on Right Now Media, we began a, um, watching uh, a series called Thriving in Babylon on Wednesday nights. I know you guys have seen that. That was, in fact, that was the first thing I ever saw on Right Now Media when you guys were watching it on your phones. And um, it's very good. It's very good. And, and I think there's six episodes and they're like 15 to 20 minutes each and very thought -provo provoking and very, uh, very interesting. So I recommend that if you'd like to take a look at that. But in chapter nine of, um, of Daniel, and we'll go there next week, I think, and look at that prayer in specific. But Daniel was aware in his situation that the end of, that the exile of, the, of, the, um, of God's people ha was coming to the end of the term of 70 years. It was getting close. He knew what the prophet Jeremiah had told the people about the exile, how long it was going to take. And he knew that it was a couple of years away. And he started praying in advance for this. We keep petitioning God. What's the plan? How's this going to happen? Lord, you said, according to your word. Now, please bring it about. I want I'm coming to you. We are sinful people. We have ignored you. We have soiled your name. We have sinned against you. How is this going to work that you're going to bring us out of this captivity? So he was familiar with the prophecies of Jeremiah, and he pleaded according to God's word to God. And the sin, or excuse me, the prayer, and the, the fervency that it took, the energy and the strength that it took, the fasting and the dedication and the, the commitment that it took on his behalf made him frail and weak. He was not strong. And so I want to um, take a look at something in Daniel chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. And I know that I've touched on this at some point in time in the past. I think I said, yeah, it is chapter 10. Daniel had prayed, and his prayer had been over the course of quite a while. Quite a while. And as he was sitting on the, the, the banks of a river, he said, A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you and stand up. For I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. 
since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concer concerns a time yet to come. There was a mighty move of God coming according to God's timetable in response to Daniel's petition on behalf of the people. Daniel was saying the words to God that God needed to hear on behalf of the people. And there was a mighty move of God to restore his people back to Jerusalem, back to their land. And the enemy was not happy about that. Daniel was an important part of that with his prayer. And there was great, with a capital G, spiritual resistance to God's will being done in what he wanted to do for his people. There was a mighty angel, an angelic being, a fallen angelic being, who was given power and authority to thwart the work of God in the area of Persia. This agent of evil, this minister of Satan, an angelic being, had authority over an area, over a region, over a nation. And his responsibility was to keep that from the hand of God, to keep God from moving in that area. And in doing so, there was war, battles raging in the unseen heavenly realm, in the second heaven. It was going on. And Daniel's prayers had been heard from the first day that he prayed them, but the angel Gabriel who was sent to him to respond to that prayer was inhibited from getting there by this spiritual force of wickedness. And it was so powerful that it required more than Gabriel. It required the highest of all the angels, Michael, to come to his assistance to open the way to clear the path for him to go and to reveal to Daniel what the next process, was, what, what the answer to the prayer was going to be and what God was going to do as a result. Daniel had invaded the space of this enemy. And part of the affliction, part of the suffering that Daniel went through, I am sure, had something to do that was put upon him as an individual by this spiritual force or this spiritual influ influence so that his suffering was acute. You're going to mess with my stuff? You want God to do something for his people in my land? You're going to pay. And that can apply to any one of us who decides to get on board and engage the Lord to move. The resistance to God's work was great, and it continues to be so even today. The resistance to God's will being done in this world will not stop until the Lord Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom once and for all. And in the New Testament, even in this, we can see that there, there are differentiations between these angelic beings. There was one angel who had power and authority in the area of, Asia, of Persia, and another who had power and authority in the area of Greece. And this is not new. This goes back many, many years. And it continues today. I remember a long time ago talking with Joe Hamill about the area of Webster to, into Southbridge. And he was familiar with the people and the situations in that town 
especially Southbridge, and he says that's a, there's a stronghold of evil in that area with regards to drugs. And when we first moved to Douglas, there was a problem with incest in the community here, and even going that way a little bit to Sutton. We heard story after story after story. Our next door neighbor was a nurse, and there were children who came to the hospital and struggling with these issues and, you know, that result from that. So the enemy influences people and situations in different ways, and strongholds do get built up. In fact, this hierarchy of angelic power, authority, and strength is involved in engaging heavenly warfare to influence nations, generations, and individuals. Families, if you will, in the generations. James Gall, who I mentioned to you before, is from Franklin, Tennessee, says there are five conflicts that go on in the spiritual realm, God versus Satan, the elect angels versus the fallen angels, Satan versus the saints, Satan versus the unsaved, and the law of the mind versus the law of the spirit, which it goes on inside of enlightened men and women who have accepted Christ as Savior. So, when a spiritual influence like the spirit of, that was influential in Persia, given the power to manifest himself in Persia, the, the teacher in the um, Thriving in Babylon series says that it was the worst of the worst of the worst. Depravity, hatred, murder, you name it, it happened there. It was the pits. The manifestation of evil had no limit in that area. This was a powerful spiritual influence that the remnants thereof still exist today. And we can see it in our nation as we look at the manifestations of evil that exist all around us in this country. And we've spoken to that and shared conversations about that over the past few months, well, probably even since the past election, but even into the previous administration with regards to politics, there is a spiritual influence there. And to generations, you know, families, there's that quote, in the sins of the father shall be passed down upon the children. It's real. It's real. Things my father and his father struggled with, I struggle with, and my brother struggles with. I know two sisters who manifest behaviors very similar to each other. Where does that come from? Is it hereditary? No, I believe it's the effects of the spiritual uh, influence in the lives of the family that they grew up in and how that manifests itself. And even to, to individuals. The enemy picks people for a reason. Especially people who might be spiritually inclined or spiritually intuitive, that God has a desire, just like God wanted to move the Israelites out of their exile and move them back to their land. So it is with an individual who is burdened and has needs. There are people he wants to touch and use for his honor and for his glory and to bring them in and graft them into his family and bring them into his kingdom of righteousness and truth. And these are the things that Paul talks about. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 
me just give you a, a little background before we read the verse. It's chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. Paul was in a situation where false teachers were saying things that were untrue about him. They were trying to harm his ministry of the gospel. They were trying to inhibit the effectiveness of what it was that he was trying to accomplish on behalf of Christ. And it was affecting the Corinthian church to the point that they were saying wrong things about Paul. They misunderstood his intent. They misunderstood his behaviors. And this was spiritually influenced because it was inhibiting and influencing the effective work of Paul spreading the gospel. Just like Daniel's prayer, the, inhibit, the inhibiting of the work, of the effectiveness of the work, the inhibiting of the effectiveness of the church of Jesus Christ to perform its mission and to do what it's, taught, what it's called to do. And Paul said, with regards to addressing these issues by these people who had been spiritually influenced to the detriment of the ability for the gospel to be moving out from the church, he says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And earlier when I referred to things of the, 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 um, the toll of prayer, that it can take on a persistent prayer for an individual, you can learn, come to doubt, you can come to fear, you can come to stress and have anxiety about what's going on, why your prayer isn't being answered the way that it is. That can become a stronghold. The power of the Holy Spirit can overcome that because greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. And as I take God's word and I use that to overcome these situations where I have allowed something to take root inside of me that is not true, that is not productive, that is a lie. Then I become effective in my prayer again and the stronghold is torn down. And Paul says... On the contrary, we, they have divine power, the weapons that we fight with, to demolish strongholds, to tear down the strongholds in the behavior of the people that we are praying for. This is why it's important that we're, we find places of comfort where we can talk with each other about the reality of the behaviors that are affecting the lives of people that we care about. Because we're talking about strongholds being torn down in people's lives. We're talking about situations and problems that go back generations that have affected and afflicted families. Pride, false pride, lust, greed, envy, judgmentalism passed down from generation to generation to generation. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul delineates this even a little bit more. He says, this is something that we are all familiar with and have heard before. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Don't rely upon yourself. Don't take what you see and say it could never change. Absolutely not. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is what Daniel was dealing with, and he didn't realize it to the full until it was explained to him. We have it right here in black and white before us, and we have this understanding and can have this understanding as we get down on our knees, either literally or figuratively, and we ask God to do what we know is his will in the life of someone that we care about. And there will be resistance if we are sincere and if we apply ourselves to it 
wholeheartedly, with discipline, with authority. We pour ourselves into it, if you will. I looked up, I always wanted to know this, but I had a thought about our little church here. And I always wanted to know about um, the breakdown in the army. What's a corps? What's a, what's a brigade? What's a regiment? What's the difference of battalion, a squad, a company, a platoon, a troop? What, what are all those things? It has to do with the size and the, the rank of the leader. So an army is two or more corps. Well, let's start from the bottom up. There is a section. A section is a very small, maybe, maybe, maybe one or two to uh, six or seven would form a section. When two sections come together, which would be eight to 24, that's a squad. And a sergeant leads them. A platoon or a troop would be two or more squads, 16 to 50 men, people. A first lieutenant would be their leader, commander. A company, two or more platoons, 100 to 250 with a captain or a major as their leader. And then there's a battalion, four or more companies, 400 to 1,000 with a lieutenant colonel as their, their leader. And a regiment, two or more battalions, 1,000 to 2,000 with a colonel. Then there's a brigade, three or more battalions, 1,500 to 3,500 soldiers, major general, brigadier, or colonel leading them. And then there's a division, three or more brigades or regiments, 10 to 15,000 soldiers, lieutenant general or major general would lead them. And then finally, a corps, two or more divisions, 25 to 50,000 general or lieutenant general leaders, and then there is the army at large as a whole, represented by a minimum of two or more corps, 100 to 150,000 men, led by a field marshal or a general. And so, as we consider the reality of spiritual warfare and what that is and what that means, and I think about our little little church here, our getting mature together church. We can be effective in our giving, we can be effective in our praying, we can be effective in our fellowship and in our teaching and in our loving one another and sharing with one another and bearing one another's burdens. And God will never call any of his squads or platoons to a mission that they are not qualified for or equipped to do. And as you think back upon what the last four or five years has been like here, we are called to pray. We are called to pray, we are called to love, we are called to fellowship with one another, we are called to spend time with one another and share and carry the burdens that we all care about together. But prayer, is the greatest weapon that we have as our resource. And our prayers need to be based upon the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse six, no one is like you, Lord. You are great and your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear the king of nations? This is your due among all the wise leaders of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. So Lord, I acknowledge that here before you right now, on my knees, move according to your plan and according to your will in this situation, in that circumstance, and this little platoon, this little troop, D troop, if you will, not F troop, we're D troop, Troop Douglas. As we learn and we, we, we seek to pray with effect to the situations and pray with per persistence for the situations, for the people, I think I just thinking, I look at Amy, I look at Kathy, I look at Carol, the, the children that you 
have influence over and who you see things that we don't see, the reality of sin in the lives of families and how that manifests in the lives of their children. I hear the stories that Kathy tells, it's sad. It's sad, there's a lot of junk that goes on in the schools, but you have the opportunity to pray for these children and believing that God can, will, do and do the things that you are asking for is a powerful thing. But realize this, a soldier is fine as long as he's in the barracks, but once he gets engaged in combat, there is opportunity for affliction, for injury, for wounding. It can be scary to think about the reality of that. Here I am preaching about invading the enemy's space, and I have been sick as a dog all week. No strength. No strength. Couldn't do anything but sleep half of the time. Every time I tried to sit down and concentrate, I heard and knew this is where it needed to go. But every time I tried to sit down and concentrate and focus, I felt affliction. I felt... And there are a lot of sick among us. It, it grieved my heart a little bit to know that Gail wasn't going to be able to be here this morning because she is a mighty warrior when it comes to prayer. She is a faithful, committed person of prayer. But I know that she will watch this on Facebook, so I, I'm glad for that, but it's, it's, all, it's always wonderful to see the faces and to feel the connection. That's real, you know. So. The Lord provides according to the mission that he gives. And he has given us a mission. He has given us a call. And so when something appears on the, on the, the pray with me list with a repetition, even though it's vague in its concept, be faithful and pray for that thing. Be faithful and pray for that thing, please. Because that's how we are connected the most in this church. We have a small group here and a small group there, but not as many as I wish we did. But that way we stay connected and we are praying for the same things. And we are exercising one voice to the Lord God Almighty. And I, I am going to ask him to show his hand and to see results of the things that we have been praying about. I read prophetic notes from time to time. I try not to keep my mind fully immersed in that stuff because there's a lot of crazy people out there in the Christian world when it comes to those things. But there's a lot of stable and sound-minded people in the, in the prophetic realm. There's a move of God coming when things that we don't expect to see will come again. The flatness of the church's uh, heartbeat, if you will, will jump and leap again in time. So be faithful, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, and realize that you can be esteemed of the Lord through your prayers. Amen. Share one more thing with you that came to me this week as I was thinking about this message and um, Franklin Graham. His father, Billy Graham, was a great evangelist and took the gospel to many stadiums and to millions of people around the world over time. That was his call. That's what he did. And now look at Franklin Graham, what he is doing. He is, he is ministering through the body of Christ with Samaritan's Purse, ministering to hurting people and bringing the gospel, as well as needs meeting ministries to people who are in trouble throughout the world. But not only that, he is coming and he's drawing Christians from different denominations, different groups together to pray. That last line of one accord. His position, what God has placed him in a role of, is to have authority in an area that his father could not do. But he gave his authority to his son and that God is using that authority, that, that legacy, if you will, to a broader, more effective in God's timing. In God's timing and according to his plan.
May the church be bold. Let's receive the benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, now and forever and ever. Amen.